better, but this angle. Okay. Yes, I think this is much nicer. Yeah. Don't you think? Say hello to my wife, Kathleen. Uh, yes. Very nice yeah. to see her photo. Uh, I hope you have many children. <laughs> At least three or four. At least three or four. Is yes. Is that Kathleen? At least three or four. Is that's what she wants to? Very she, good. She, she, when she was young, she wanted to start an orphanage in China. <laughs> oh, they have plenty of orphanages already. And I know quite a number of American couples going to adopt daughters from China because the uh, communists limit the families, only allow one child. And uh, the peasants, if they have only one girl, the girl is married to another village and the two old people can't work anymore, no money, who is going to look after them? So they all want to have sons. And uh, there were many tragic stories about little girl babies being discarded. So the government now organized the orphanages and allow people from abroad to come and adopt Chinese girls. They're all girls. You go to the orphanages, there is not a single boy. It's sad. Mm -hmm. But those little girls came to America, they get spoiled. <laughs> yeah, I, I got invited. They have an organization. Uh, this was in the late 80s, I think 89 or 90. Uh, I met one lady with a little Chinese girl in the waiting room of my allergy doctor. And she was spoiling that kid. And uh, th when she turned around and saw me, she said, oh, you're Nian Cheng. I said, indeed, I am. She said, oh, I just finished your book. Uh, I w went to get my daughter, and I thought I should read your book. Uh, I said, thank you for reading it. And she said, then the little girl was climbing all over her and hitting her face and so on. I said, look, you're not bringing her up right. <laughs> I said, you know, kids need some rules and regulations. You should tell her you're not uh, to climb on my knee, uh, on my lap. When I'm talking to somebody, you should tell her. <laughs> I think American mothers inclined to spoil their kids. They don't believe in discipline. Uh, but those kids are all nicely dressed. So they, she uh, told the other mothers, they have an organization that she met me. So they invited me to talk to them, to meet, uh, meet them all. There were over 200 families at that time in this area who have Chinese little girls. So I agreed and uh, they hired a hall in the church, and uh, there were at least 60 mothers. Some fathers came to, uh, and we had a very nice afternoon, and the little girls running around, all dressed up in their party clothes. I said to myself, you know, these were peasant kids. If they didn't come to America, what kind of life would they have? Their parents may not even have the money to put them through school, let alone go to university. And all these uh, women I met were well educated. Many of them have jobs and uh, quite senior in offices, lawyers and uh, business uh, women. And uh, those girls are going to have a wonderful life in America. But uh, in China now, there is a shortage of young women. Mm -hmm. So there are gangs who abduct young girls. Mm -hmm. uh, they go to the countryside and say to the young girls, I can find you a job. And because the countryside is still very, very poor, mm -hmm. so the girls fall into their trap and went with them and actually uh, they make them become Prostitute. prostitutes. Yeah. Oh, and th some girls run away and got home, many, and then they sell them. 
they sell them to poor peasants who can't afford to, to get a wife because there is a shortage of girls. So the parents of girls uh, require the future son-in-law to pay, to buy this, to buy that, and uh, the poor peasants don't have the money. Good. Let me, let me do one thing. <clears throat> let me just see if everything is okay. So t tell us a little bit about um, when you grew up in Sh you grew up in Shanghai, right? No, I, I grew up in Beijing. Oh, you grew up in Beijing? Yes, I only started to live in Shanghai 1948, mm -hmm. when my husband and I returned from Australia. Uh, after uh, we were married in England, after we both finished our studies at London School of Economics, mm -hmm. we were married 1938. And we traveled back to China. It was a very hard trip with lots of Chinese students from all over Europe. Mm -hmm. We had to take a French ship to go to Saigon, that's Ho Chi Minh City now. And we couldn't get immediately the tickets. We had to stop many days. Then we got another little ship to go to Haifang. That's north, a seaport. From Haifang, we disembarked, then again delayed several days. There were n nearly 50 of us. Then we traveled by train to Hanoi, which was the capital city of Vietnam. And from Hanoi, we could get on that tr train all the way to Kunming. You know, this was built by the French through the mountains. And you look out of the window, it's a sheer drop into the, uh, yes, I don't know uh, what is in there. Uh, we saw monkeys and climbing around on the mountains. Some people say they're not monkeys. They're the local uh, uh, tribes people. They, they climb like mountains. They wear very little, not no clothes, just some, uh, you know. Aborigines? Yeah, uh, yeah they, they were very dark. Anyway, we got to Kunming. Oh, the place. Couldn't find a place to live. We bagged only one hotel run by a Frenchman. We, we bagged him. We, there were about five or six girls. He said, I will let the girls sleep on the dining table after we serve dinner. The man said, we can sleep on the floor. We don't have enough things to put on the floor for you. Oh, they said, never mind. We just want a shelter. So some of the men came, and I was married, newly married to my husband, and he had to go somewhere else. Um, he graduated from Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing. And uh, I went to Yanjing University in Beijing, so we both spoke Mandarin. And um, then he decided Tsinghua during the war combined with two other Chinese universities and formed a university in Kunming. So he looked up his old professor, and uh, they all knew him, of course. So he stayed with his professor. But his professor only had one room with his wife, and they had no, uh, I went there to dinner. They had no furniture. They were using packing uh, crates for tables and se seats. They were living terribly uh, poorly. And uh, we stayed like that for, oh, I think, uh, 10 days before we got one ticket on the plane. So I said to my husband, you go. Uh, you have to go and find a job and a place to live. Because Chongqing was just as crowded as Kunming, all these refugees from the coastal areas. So we didn't get to Chong. Oh, and he flew to Chongqing. And uh, very Im almost immediately, he went to Weijiaobu, that is a foreign service of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
and uh, I hitched a ride on a truck that belonged to International Red Cross because I ran into this woman who was my school friend in Kunming and she was married to a Chinese from Singapore who worked for the International Red Cross. So I, I said, I'm stuck here. I, I, there is no plane ticket, and I'm thinking of going to Chongqing by bus. Oh, she said, no, that's very dangerous. You know, the uh, uh, buses, uh, they always have too many passengers with their luggage. So many of them tip over and uh, have terrible accident. She said, I'll ask my husband if they can give you a ride. And they had three trucks which drove from Free China, that is Chongqing and Kunming and uh, Chengdu, and uh, on that same road to uh, Chongqing. And, uh, you know, that's part of Burma Road, you know. Anyway, they were coming to uh, uh, Kunming to get supply of medicine to ship to uh, free China and there was an American couple because the truck only have two seats one is the driver one seat and naturally they they have one truck there were two Chinese both men they have one truck there was a third truck only one Danish worker for International Red Cross a young man and empty seat so I got it and I traveled with them. It took, oh, I think, a week wow. before we could, because we had to stop at the villages. It's too dangerous to drive at night. Also, they buried gasoline underground at different villages. Mm. So on our way back, we can fill the tank mm. and also do some other business. And uh, we would, there were six of us, the, the farmer, they have definite uh, families that serve the, these Red Cross trucks. And when we got there, they will ha have ready already maybe a few eggs and uh, some uh, uh, rice cooked already. And then they spread the hay on the ground. We will lie on those. N no water to have a, a wash your face. Couldn't take your clothes off. So li literally, we, I lived like that for one week. And my face was coated with dust because you can't keep the windows closed, especially my truck, because the Danish young man was a chain smoker. And he would take his hand off the steering wheel and light his cigarette. And I said to him, look here, let me light your cigarette for you. Anyway, we got there and uh, uh, it was an adventure. So I wrote an article for a British newspaper mm. uh, about that trip. It was fantastic. We got there and my husband found, because he came from a Christian family. I, I didn't come from a Christian family, but my family, I don't, uh, my mother uh, was a Buddhist, but she did not try to influence the kids. You know, she was very, very quiet old-fashioned Chinese lady, and uh, it will stop by itself. And uh, she was not very interested in any of the children, or we had many, many servants to uh, raise the children, you know. My father went to Japan when he was very young, something like 18, to go to the naval school. And when I had a lecturing tour in Japan, after my book came out, the Japanese took me to see the place. It's on an island. Wow. And they printed out my father's record. And it, he went with a group of Chinese students. Uh, you know, in 1895, China was defeated in a naval battle by Japan. That's when China lost Taiwan and Japan occupied Korea. and. Uh, I was warmly received by the, I mentioned in my book one sentence 
that my father was educated in Japan. And uh, the commandant received me, and he gave me a briefing. Then he sent me with uh, one of his subordinates to look around the whole island we drove, you know, from building to building. And he sh they showed me the dormitory my father lived in, now it's a classroom, and so on. So when we finished, he invited me to lunch with him. So uh, I went, came back and I said to him, he said, do you have any questions? Oh, I said, only one question. I said, how come your, uh, my, the building my father uh, came was a dorm? Now it's a classroom. How come the Americans didn't bomb it? Because this is a naval college, and right close by was Hiroshima. I said, why didn't they bomb it or do something about it? Oh, he said, uh, no, they didn't bomb us. Uh, they, uh, however, they did some damage. Oh, I said, I suppose that's natural because they occupy uh, Japan. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, they chopped down all the cherry blossom trees because the trees were full of worms. <laughs> I, I, he spoke fluent English. So I said, I congratulate you on your command of the English language. Oh, he said, I spent several years at Annapolis. <laughs> so uh, my father was uh, in Japan many years, and uh, I learned about his life there. And uh, it was very interesting. And so he had no religion, but we had ancestor worship for Chinese New Year Eve. That's yesterday evening. We all had to kneel down and knock our head <laughs> with a photo of my grandparents. And they have tall red candles. Uh, so I met my husband in London, and my mother-in-law, um, this was before Japan attacked China. We, I was there 35 to 38. Japan attacked China 37. So the, I got to know my husband almost right away because I was the only Chinese student, uh, woman student when I was there the first year. Second year, a friend of mine came to join. And um, there were a number of Chinese men students. You know, we Chinese, when we eat a meal, we like to have soup. <laughs> more than the Westerners. And the London School of Economics dining room uh, has a part, one third of it. You can sit down. It's only when you sit down and pay more that you can have soup. <laughs> the other section buffet. So the Chinese student who can afford it always go to that section. And I met them all and they were number of men students. My husband was among them. So I was very lonely, all by myself, 20 years old, British climate. Uh, I went there end of September. The term started in October, 1st of October. Three terms in England, the college. And um, the day gets shorter, it gets dark outside. 2.30 in the afternoon, in the library, you have to put the lights on. Oh, I was miserable. I was homesick, and I made friends with some English girls, but not many. So I always said to my husband, if I weren't so lonely, maybe I wouldn't have got to know you so well. So he always came at the he was working for a PhD. He had, the PhD student had a, upstairs uh, in the library, we were not allowed to go to, but they can come down to get the books and uh, uh, mix with the undergraduate. Where was this So school? when we finished, we, we, mar we got married. In where, where was the school again? Mm -hmm. Where was the school that you met? 
uh, London School of Economics. Where, where is that? In Shanghai? Yes, in London. Oh, London. You, yes. So you were in... in oh, yes. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, what year was, uh, were you there? 35 to 38. Okay. St their university is three years. I had two years university in Yanjing, and uh, my father wanted me to get out of Beijing because uh, the, he knew the Japanese. He thought they were coming mm -hmm. uh, to attack China, will be a war. But actually, they didn't attack China until 37. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to uh, England also because the Chinese ambassador was my father's friend, mm -hmm. so he could keep an eye on me. <laughs> uh, I had a good time there, and I just uh, wrote something for them. They wanted, you know, we have very uh, well-known alumni. Uh, one is Paul Walker, mm -hmm. another is Mr. Thoreau. He has, he's a multi-billionaire, so he donates a lot of money, and they have a foundation here. When I went to this school, uh, it was f uh, free for the British student, foreign student had to pay a fee. It's very international even then. Uh, I, I knew a, a girl from India, a girl from Romania, or French, oh, they all come to this. It's the best school for economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, even now, the, their graduates uh, in Washington, uh, I, uh, they have a uh, alumni club, and I've been a few times there, but each time I was the oldest. And they asked me to speak. That's how I started go, uh, going. Then they invite me for this and that. I turned up a couple of times, then I stopped. I said, I'm too busy. Now I say I'm too old. And uh, I, But uh, the foundation in New York communicated with me. Uh, uh, because in my will, I have left them quite a bit of money uh, for both my husband and I, myself. Mm -hmm. You know, the London School of Economics, uh, looking back, I was, you know, before I went there, can you imagine a Chinese woman, 20 years old? Uh, a, we weren't educated because our parents expect us to be independent and have a job, no, not at all, to have a good husband. Oh, my generation of Chinese women didn't work. If I went to work, my husband lose face, you know. So uh, he was, uh, we went to Chongqing, then he was appointed to Australia. And we were in Australia seven years. And Mei Ping, my daughter, was born there. Why we were staying so long? Because normally three or four years, you know, was because my husband, this is a complicated story, but it's interesting. You know, uh, America used to have a Chinese exclusion law. That is, a Chinese uh, in America uh, could live here could be a resident, but she, she or he cannot be a citizen unless they were born here. But because China was an allied, part of the allied uh, uh, comrade during the Second World War, so they abolished that China, Chinese Exclusion Act and grant Chinese immigrants citizenship. Because America did it, Canada also did it, follow. Australia had a white Australian policy. They treated the Chinese uh, who lived there, e uh, business people, uh, restaurant owners and so on, even worse than Canada and the uh, United States. But they wanted, and all the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs my husband was number two in the embassy, and they assigned him to negotiate with uh, Australia. It was a very hard negotiation. Oh, uh, we were in close contact with the Im uh, Minister of Immigration. He loved Chinese food. We had a uh, Chinese cook. 
from Hong Kong. Literally, he came to dinner every week. We tried to cultivate him, you know, and we, uh, his son got sick, and we ordered medicine for him from America and all that. Finally, the agreement was signed. Forty-eight, my husband signed. All these Chinese business people overseas, they collected a huge amount of money they wanted to give to my husband. My husband said, no, I, I, you can write something to say thank you, a letter or something, but I cannot accept any money. So he didn't take anything. They said, my gosh, you're wrong, you're wrong. Everybody takes money. All the Chinese officials take money. You're the only one. My husband said, I, I can't help it. This is my principle. So we left and went back to Shanghai. Then he was appointed director of the Shanghai office of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So we started to live in Shanghai. Actually, uh, my mother and father by then had moved to Nanking, where my brother had a house, younger brother, and he actually went to England. Anyway, uh, then uh, his mother was in Jinan. When we arrived back in China, 1948, Jinan was already occupied by the communists. We did not go to Taiwan with the Kuomintang government because my husband wanted to get his mother to come and live with us. We had to wait until the communists took Shanghai, then we can travel by train to Jinan and bring my mother-in-law to come and live with us. When the communists first came, they were very nice to us because the man who took over my husband's office was a Tsinghua graduate. They didn't meet. This man was ahead of my husband. They didn't meet in school, but they, and uh, she, he also married a Yanjing graduate. Uh, I knew this woman too. Uh, they were very nice too. They asked him if he could help them uh, to get to know Shanghai, the foreign uh, business people and all that. This group of people belonged to Zhou Enlai. Zhou Enlai had his own. You know the Communist Party leadership. They are not unanimous. Uh, Zhou Enlai's group came from France. They were called the French group because they were all students in France and they joined the French Communist Party. And then as a group, they came back and joined the Chinese. And Mao Zedong was a guerrilla leader, so he had the military. He always controlled the military so that nobody can overthrow him. And uh, uh, this Zhang Hanfu was the name of the man who took over from my husband. He asked my husband to be their advisor for one year. And my husband said, all right, help them to during the transition uh, period. And then he was, uh, uh, he went to teach at two universities. One was the uh, Dongwu East, uh, I don't know the, the uh, English name, Dongwu uh, University of Law. Another was Xinjiang's University. But when Korean War broke out, uh, St. John's University was uh, uh, swallowed up by some other university, and Dongwu University moved. So my husband uh, was asked by Shell if he would become general manager in Shanghai because they felt with the communists here, it's better to have a Chinese uh, manager. So my, uh, my husband asked the communists, Saying? What were you saying <clears throat> about you know China and women? I, I think the communists did two good things okay. in China. Mm -hmm. 
when is the Chinese women nowadays? Uh, I grew up always had a, I felt myself inferior to men because I always asked my husband opinion and so on and um, put him first and uh, uh, order food. You know, I had a cook uh, every morning. He will come and uh, tell me what he got in the market because living under the communists, you can't say, I want to eat this, I want to eat that. He goes to the market, tried his best to get whatever he could. And since uh, we had uh, big pay, you know, my husband was manager for Shell, uh, so any, the price was no problem. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the availability is the problem. Mm -hmm. There simply wasn't anything you can buy. So he will come back and say, I managed to get this and that. Then I always order uh, the food, uh, what he should cook and how he should cook it, according to what my husband liked. I never thought of ordering food because I like it. You better not tell this to my wife here. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, my Chinese women of my. But nowadays, uh, the w Chinese women, they feel totally equal with men. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what the communists did. It gave them the opportunity uh, to get out and get educated, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, have jobs. N not in the rural area. I'm talking about the middle class, uh, uh, people who can afford to go. To, and they made uh, university education free, uh, even provided food at the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, so, although the food was uh, very plain and so on. Uh, you could, if you pass the exam, you could go to university. Your family doesn't ha didn't have to pay anything. But uh, it didn't last very long because the government can't afford it. So, uh, but entering high school and university, there, there was preferential treatment, uh, like uh, in the United States, but for people who are poor. My, my daughter had to pass average 80% on all subjects, average, from junior high to senior high. But if she were a girl from a working class family, uh, she can pass with 60. So I used to say, this is unfair, this is unfair. Uh, my daughter said, oh, no, 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 no. Now, it's fair because the teacher explained to us that uh, the working class kids, when they got, get home, they have to do housework. They have to look after the little little ones, and we have uh, we don't need to. We can do our homework, and uh, if we don't know, our parents can help us even. So we should. And uh, she said, in any case, we can all pass eighty quite easily. And <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you, why did you and your husband go back to China in 1948? You know. Oh, uh, we why, we, why, why we, we had to. You, you had mean 48? Well, you went to back to China from from uh, Australia, right? Yes. Why, oh, yes. But he back? was a part of the Kuomintang go government. Right. He was transferred to this job. I see. You see, mm -hmm. we didn't expect the Kuomintang to f collapse like that, you know. And, and when, when the communists did... Actually, did he was uh, in the uh, time we were in China. It's less than a year mm -hmm. the communists came. Uh, he got rather disillusioned. So he started teaching even before the Kuomintang went away. He's, he said, I didn't come from an influential family. Uh, in Kuomintang's uh, system, I will get nowhere. This is as much, as, as high as I would ever get. Uh, and I don't enjoy dealing with those officials because in my hearts of hearts, I despise them. 
they all are corrupt. I, I, I mustn't show it, and uh, I, I want to leave the government, he said. I will go to teach as a professor. He didn't expect the communists will take over all the colleges and schools. And there was really, once we made the decision to stay to get my mother-in-law to come and live with us, and he will have a quiet life teaching university, we made the wrong decision. We didn't count on the communists controlling the universities. He also, he wasn't a member of the Kuomintang Party because he joined during the war. And this was, during the war, it was supposed to be a united front. Kuomintang employed people who were not party members to give the American an impression that they are democratic. So they never asked him to join the party. So that was good. That was good yeah. to a certain extent. But also, uh, I think if the Zhou Enlai people could have controlled the government, uh, there wouldn't have been a cultural revolution. It was, you know, Mao felt threatened. Well, the, I explained it in my book. Uh, Mao, you read Dr. Lee's book. As he got older and older, he never went uh, to the office. He stayed at home, and from morning to night, he wore pajamas, just relax. And if he wanted to speak to any of the senior officials, he let them come. So it was one-to-one -one conversation. He never had attended a discussion group, and he had all kinds of uh, ideas that he wanted to Ch Chinese people to. Of course, the Chinese people's character, the tradition, contributed or worsened Mao's uh, behavior because uh, the Chinese believe in what the uh, Chinese call bao xi bu bao you. You report happy things. Never report to your senior officer uh, failures. Bao xi bu bao you. So Mao couldn't go down to the village to see what his policy is doing. He depended on people to report to them. They all told him big lies. They said everything's working fine and so on. So that aggravated the situation. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Mao failed in the great leap forward. Uh, you compare the Chinese official population figure, mm -hmm. you will discover 20 million people disappeared during that time. They died, and most of them were peasants, because you are the production chief. The peasants under you in the commune, all the peasants under you have to produce so much. Now, you don't dare to report that your, the area under your control was not meeting the quota. So instead of saying we fill the quota, you exaggerate, you add something. Because what you reported was much higher than the actual production, you have to make the peasants hand over much more of what they produce. And they are left with hardly anything. So do you think they will work? Naturally, they don't work. And in any case, for agriculture, you can't run it this way, the bureaucratic way. The of official is sitting in a room. He decides what crop to plant. And the team, uh, head of the team, blow a whistle, all the peasants come out, and they start working. Blow a whistle, all go back. That's no way to do agriculture. 
you have to watch the uh, weather, and if it suddenly rains in the middle of the night, you have to get up and go and do something. Nobody did anything. So also the production figure naturally declined because of the commune. And Mao had this crazy idea that to have more production, you should plant the rice and the wheat very close. And you have to dig deep, turn the earth over. The Chinese, for generations, they fertilize. So the top soil, when you dig very deep, turn the, the top soil with all the nutrients were buried underneath. So instead of improving production, it declined. And also, you plant everything so close, they don't grow. The air can't go through. And also, Mao advocate natural insecticides, because uh, to buy the chemical insecticides costs a lot of money. So he has all kinds of uh, ideas that you should cultivate certain kind of bugs. Those bugs will eat the bad bugs. But the bugs don't listen to him, so it didn't work. And then he had this brainwave that um, somebody uh, dissected a sparrow, and they found rice in the sparrow's stomach. So they multiply. Eat one sparrow eat so much rice, and China had billions of sparrows that much rice is lost. So we had a campaign to kill the sparrows. Every, my daughter was a little girl at that time. Uh, this was before 1958. She had to hand over two sparrows dead when she went to school. All the time in Shanghai, every family must kill the sparrows. And you climb on the roof and wave a red flag to frighten the sparrows, make them fly, 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 until they drop dead. Instead, what we did, and our neighbors were putting rice in a little plate under the hedges, and the sparrows all come and feed themselves on our, what we gave them. So they didn't fly around over our houses, and uh, we got away with it. But what, am I, uh, what are we going to do? My daughter had to hand over two sparrows tomorrow. We didn't kill any sparrows. What are we going to do? My cook said, don't worry. Tomorrow morning, I will get up very early. I will go to the countryside that he rode on his bicycle to the edge of Shanghai, quite a long way, you know, an hour's riding. And he came back with two dead sparrows. I said, how did you get this? He said, peasants, Chinese are born businessmen. <laughs> Some peasants heard that the schools require every student to bring two sparrows, dead sparrows. They killed all the sparrows and sold them. To sold two sparrows to my cook. Wasn't that funny? <laughs> That's how we lived under Mao, you know? Let me, let me ask you, in your book, you talked a little bit about your house as an oasis of peace, you know, it was very uh, tranquility. Uh, uh, yes, tell, because... Tell us a little bit about, about your home in, in, in Well, Shanghai. I had, uh, you, uh, you know, because my father studied in Japan, and knew the Japanese military people, naval people especially. They used to come to our house for dinner and so on before they attacked China. So as soon as they attacked China, my father went to Shanghai and bought a small house and lived there. To, uh, this was in the French uh, settlement, mm -hmm. so the Japanese couldn't come. This was before 41. While Wang Jingwei, was organizing a, a quizzling government. My father was afraid that his Jap former Japanese friend would ask him to join this government. So he hid there 
But then the government was formed. It was Admiral Lin, who didn't hide. He became the minister of the Navy mm -hmm. after, uh, for Wang Jingwei's government, mm -hmm. the Kui Lei, Chinese call, mm -hmm. puppet government. Mm -hmm. the, but in the West, it's called the Quisling government. Mm -hmm. And this man was uh, shot, death penalty, shot by the Kuomintang. Uh, his daughters are here, and we, it, uh, I see them quite often because they were all good friends. They went to Japan together. But my father escaped because by the time he emerged, they were not looking for anybody anymore. So we ha he had this little house. And when my husband was alive, we lived in a house that belonged to Shell. He was general manager. It's very big. We had even a tennis court in our garden. And we had two doormen who took turns. And there is a driveway in the, into the garden mm -hmm. and the front door uh, away from the street. Mm -hmm. But after he died, the new British manager came and I had to move out. Mm -hmm. So I moved into that little house my father had and he made it to me, for me. He gave it to me at that time. And they were living in Nanking. And so uh, this small house had three rooms in, on each floor. Mm -hmm. uh, two rooms, not as long as this, but about two-thirds. Mm -hmm. Two rooms, about like that. Mm -hmm. One is my, uh, the uh, ground floor. Mm -hmm. One is a dining room, one is a, a, a living room. Mm -hmm. And the smaller one, uh, there is a smaller room about from here to here is, was my daughter's study. And upstairs, uh, and then of course there is kitchen, pantry, and uh, you walk out the door, you can go to the garden. The garden was quite small. And uh, we had uh, uh, the servants, uh, two bedrooms uh, over there, the other side of the uh, kitchen. And the first floor was my bedroom, my study, and uh, my, my daughter's bedroom. My daughter's bedroom had a balcony, which uh, my maid used to hang the laundry. And he, she had her bathroom, I had my bathroom. And the third floor, the same, one bathroom only. The maid uh, occupied one of the bedrooms. And the third room we used for storage because we had to hoard. Every time I went to Hong Kong, uh, every, I was entitled when I worked for Shell to go to Hong Kong for holiday one month each year. One whole month? One month, one whole month oh, wow. because I was in a communist country mm -hmm. each year. I took it every two years for two months because applying to go is very hard. When my husband was alive, I accompanied him to England because he was the manager. He had to go to England. So we traveled in Europe and so on. The communists let us go because the Shanghai uh, people were always very nice to us. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, behaved ourselves. Uh, we limit our contact with the Chinese friends many friends who had uh, relatives in the uh, government or they work for the government, we cut off. Mm -hmm. Only our friends, Chinese friends, were limited to university professors. Because even when my husband was alive, we realized that we are every day with the foreigners. We don't want to be a bridge between the foreigners and the Chinese. Because under Mao, the Chinese not allowed to have foreign friends. You see, if you have a foreign friend, you have endless trouble. They're watching you day and night. Even as it was, we, had, we were working for foreign company with government permission. Uh, nevertheless, every time I have a dinner party, the very next day, 
a member of the residence, residence committee would come, usually a retired woman, uh, either school teacher or worker, industrial worker. Shanghai had many factories, uh, uh, I think very simple uh, uh, for, to produce towels or cotton cloth, you know, and those women. Uh, when they retire. They, they're usually Communist Party members. And one woman would come, without exception, and her excuse was to get some ice, because we had a party, we had two refrigerators going, she liked to have some ice. They don't have refrigerator, so we always gave her. And she would sit in the kitchen and talk to my servant. So once I discovered that, I made a point. Uh, I was the housewife. When we had a, we were going to have a party, so naturally we ordered flowers from the flower shop, and I would arrange the flowers, and the, the man servant would be standing by, with a bucket with water and the, the flower vase and all that, and I would chat with him. I would say. We're having this dinner party tonight for so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, Mr. So-and-so is the head of Chartered Bank, or Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, uh, or uh, the guests are uh, from the British uh, consulate and the Norwegian consul general. I would tell him, because if I didn't tell him, he might make a mistake. You never know. Some of the foreigners may be targeted. So I, I, I dealt with it this way, you know, mm -hmm. so he will make a report. And, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, those workers, they're very simple. And besides, uh, for them, it's a job mm -hmm. that their leader told them to report. Mm -hmm. As long as they got something to report, they, they don't care it. if it's true or not. That's right. I had... Uh, a, uh, a, a powerful radio mm -hmm. in my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And every afternoon, uh, I would listen to BBC and the Voice of America. When I come back from the office about uh, 4.30 or quarter to five, mm -hmm. I would be, uh, the, Man servant will bring a tray with tea and some cookies, put it in my study, he will go downstairs. None of my servants would come up unless I ring the bell, because they know that during that time I was listening to BBC or Voice of America. That was illegal. As long as they did not see me doing it, they didn't need to report. If they, watch, they saw me doing it, they have to report. Because if the manservant saw me do it, he didn't report. Then when they asked the uh, maid, the maid might say he was upstairs, uh, so he might know something like that. Mm -hmm. But none of them will come up unless I ring the doorbell. Then they will. So you have a way of living there. You, you are conscious, you are, for instance, we use shell car. Sometimes the English manager and I share a car to go to office mm -hmm. to save gasoline. We register three cars, and the gas we get for three cars would be enough for one car. So we share cars, and we never talk about anything. We just sit. Because if you say anything, a comment on uh, whatever, that driver, uh, he is obliged to, to, maybe periodically, this I never could verify, he may be asked, did you hear anything from the manager and Mrs. Chung? And you know I put in my book already uh, that uh, they accuse me of being the superior, although I was assistant to the manager, because he let me get in the car first. 
let me get into the elevators first. That means I was more important to Xiao. I was the spy. So you, you, you're dealing with people like that, so what can you do? Yeah. So you were the assistant manager. Um, assistant I, I was, the uh, they call it advisor. Advisor. So you yeah. work very closely to the general manager. You see, what happened was my husband was the general manager. He suddenly had discovered to have cancer. Where? Liver? In the colon. colon uh -huh. And two, two months later, he died. How old was he? 47. Wow. I was 42. Wow. And uh, Shell was caught. Mm -hmm. They had to find somebody suitable mm -hmm. and willing to come to a communist c country. Mm -hmm. And during that interval, mm -hmm. he, they must have somebody to register your chop. You know, in China, no signature. Right. Your chop right. has to be registered mm -hmm. uh, to be a responsible person. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the government will take it over. And our staff were alarmed. They didn't want to work for the government. They, they were paid so much higher by Shell. So they kept on talk, saying to me, what are we going to do? Dr. Zheng, is he getting better? Is he getting better? You know, so the manager from Hong Kong came in to see my husband. And he said, afterwards, uh, he had to stay in our house because we couldn't find uh, last one moment's notice to f find a hotel room for him. Mm -hmm. uh, all hotels controlled by the government. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was given the visa. They realized, the government realized the urgency that he had to come. Mm -hmm. So he came and uh, after I took him to the uh, hospital to see my husband, mm -hmm. this was three days before my husband died. And uh, he came back, he was very shaken, uh, and uh, I gave him a whiskey. And he sat here, I sat here, and he said to me, I, uh, uh, because every time I went to Hong Kong, I stayed in their house. Uh, he said, Nian, you know, the head office wants you to go there and hold the fort, because we have to have somebody. They don't want our office to be taken over. Well, the shell uh, treated me well. And at the same time, the government was wanting me to go to the uh, language, foreign language school. They want to expand the English department. So I was very happy shell invited me to, so I didn't want to work for the government. You know, you're under the, it's like working under a searchlight. Everybody's watching you. Mm -hmm. you. I can't live like that. I would die of a nervous breakdown, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I was very pleased. Also, working for Shell, we were allowed three foreign periodicals. Mm -hmm. So we subscribed to London Times by airmail, mm -hmm. Time magazine, from, all from Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and The Economist three, two magazines, one paper, mm -hmm. they allowed to come in. And also Shell published many, um, it's really advertisement, booklets about Shell product. Mm -hmm. Because our business was all chemical. Mm -hmm. we're not, we were not allowed to sell oil mm. oh. because of the embargo of strategic goods. Mm. America was the leader. Mm -hmm. It's banned. China was a communist country. Mm -hmm. You mustn't sell, sell anything that is considered strategic goods. Oil, of so course. What, what kind of so we sold bitumen, mm -hmm. fertilizers, mm -hmm. insecticides. Every month we had the permission to import the literature of our product. Mm -hmm. And I, this was packed in Hong Kong mm -hmm. because they want to see Nobody had written mm -hmm. Taiwan as China to offend the communists. Right. Republic of China, no, not allowed. So they, were, they didn't want to offend the communist government. So the people in Hong Kong sorted out. The ones that are, were suitable to come in, mm -hmm. they packed in a box, cardboard box, about this high. 
for our office to distribute all over China all these research organizations, chemical, mm -hmm. uh, and the universities, colleges, and so on. Hmm. So I often ask them to tuck underneath some Vogue and uh, uh, New Yorker magazine and the books I want to read in, in English, you mm -hmm. know? Uh -huh. And because I know the communist uh -huh. bureaucracy, that they will look at the top and they can't be bothered to dig to the, uh, the to look under, you know, to see what's in there. Okay, let's stop right here because I need to change the tape. <laughs> <laughs>
did you listen to what I said? I did. Could you do that? Mm -hmm. Was mm -hmm. it clear? Yes. You know, I may, I, on, when I changed the battery, yes. I, I somehow the thing got pulled out a little bit. So, uh, it's, but it's only in 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> so. So you have to uh, edit it afterwards because everything people make, they all have to edit. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you again about uh, yes. about it because we, we we didn't get the sound. Uh, I see. My mistake. So, um, so this this is you, huh? Yeah. Can you imagine? I was fifty. This is your fifty, huh? Yeah. And the next year I went to prison. The year after that. You had you had black hair. Oh yes, lots of it. Lots of it. <laughs> Came out with very little. Uh huh. And. I have false teeth now because all my teeth uh, were good, but they all had to come out. I had infection in the gum. Uh -huh. When I went to the dentist, there were many people waiting. You know, the communists, they don't separate the waiting and the, the doctor. And she, she was there and she examined. She said, my goodness, uh, she said in Chinese. Uh, heaven, you know, how come you seem to be an uh, educated woman? How come you let your teeth get like this before you come to see me? I couldn't say I was in prison. There were others waiting to see her. She said, I need to take them all out and deal with your gum. Did you take it all out? Each time, only one tooth. And during that time, I had to eat liquid food because so painful. Mm -hmm. When I was in there, I, when they gave us some food to eat, I had to squeeze the blood out, rinse my mouth, wash my mouth, mm -hmm. and eat something. Then the blood will come out, do it again. To, anyway, there is plenty of time. You can take ages to eat a little bit of rice and cabbage. You know, I've been toughened by that experience. So I don't mind uh, to live alone, carry um, uh, things, and go. Many people say, you're 88. You shouldn't live alone. You should have somebody to do shopping for you and all this. I said, as long as I can do it, I want to do it myself. I think it, without that imprisonment, I probably couldn't do it. They made me much more um, self-reliant. I, I think you, you are a tough lady. No. <laughs> uh, I have that spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, my father sent me to Nankai Girls School when I was 12. I became a boarder. Mm -hmm. I had to rely on myself when I was 12 only allowed to go home uh, for summer and winter holidays. So you were My father believed in that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when we were real small, he made us walk to school and walk back. How long was that? How oh, long? it's about 20 minutes. But uh, when you are only s seven years old, your, uh, your school uh, book, uh, Many of my uh, uh, school friends at the when, uh, primary school thought I came from a very poor family. Actually, we had a ho horse carriage and the rickshaw uh, uh, belonged to the family. Uh, he wouldn't let us uh, be pampered and walk to school. My brother and uh, uh, I was three years older than my brother next to me. So very often I'm walking there by myself because our time was not all the same. He wanted us anyway. <laughs> but I had a very uh, independent life. I had to rely on myself a lot. Maybe God was preparing me for my Right. Last period of my life, I have to be alone. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, think of it, I was 42. 
and I've been alone ever since. And I manage my own investments, uh, and uh, my from uh, grocery shopping to investment, everything depends on myself. Let me just double check again. Say something. Um, I want to go back to that, that, that night, August, again. Let's yes. Say it again. Oh, see. Yeah. The red cards. I should look up my book uh, to make sure the four oaths, what were the four oaths. I no longer remember. That I is. have my book. Oh, yes. Let's be more accurate. The red cards. Old culture, old habits, old way of thinking. What is the fourth? Old religion. Si hmm? Old religion. Old Super habits. Old, uh, I think old custom, something like that. But I will uh, get it. See if they have index. simple index. You can get this book, a uh, hardcover, uh, uh, from uh, Amazon.com for eight dollars. It's a uh, second hand, mm -hmm. but a very good second hand. I have both your, your hardcover uh, and your softcover too. You have both? Mm -hmm. I need to read it again because it's been some time. My wife was reading it. <clears throat> But then let, let me ask you again, you know, that night in August was yes. 19, 1966, uh, was it? 1966. So they, but they, they came to me on August the 30th, mm -hmm. and I was reading uh, <laughs> a book that I smuggled in. You, you know, actually, uh, when I went on the... Uh, yep. mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> mustn't I, I, I was... Uh, reading one of the books I smuggled. Do you remember what it was? I think it was uh, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> so you're reading that and they, they just came in, the, came in these, these red guards. Oh, yes. Uh, they knocked on the door. We were, I was waiting for them. You were? Oh, yes, so because so they'd been to my next door neighbor. So I, I know they are coming. So you knew. So night after night, it was, uh, uh, I didn't go to bed until midnight. Then I know they are not going to come tonight. Okay. Next night, I will sit there and wait because I didn't want them to catch me in bed. Mm. And uh, I already told the maid to stay in her room. Mm -hmm. Don't come out. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to get insulted or beaten up. Right. And uh, the manservant, uh, the cook didn't live in my house. He went home. The manservant was in the kitchen waiting for them to. And then when they banged on the uh, door, he went open. I had to, My house was like this. Two houses were built by the same person. And the inside, uh, y you have a little passage and uh, Halfway the, uh, of the passage, I had a door, wooden, double door, 
the car could drive in, and there is the garage at the end. And uh, since the car was not parked at my place, that garage I used for storage and coal. You know, in the winter we had to, uh, I had to get coal by bringing in American dollars from Hong Kong. Otherwise, you're not allowed to buy coal. Uh, you only can buy those coal balls. Uh, you cannot heat hot water and uh, have uh, central heating with that. So every year, I brought a few thousand dollars in to facilitate my life. Uh, for, for instance, one year, we need to repair that gate. We couldn't buy wood. We had to go to a special shop, or not a shop, office, to show them I have American dollars. They deduct the cost of the wood. Then I send the carpenter to go there and pick up the wood and repair my garage door. Crazy. The ordinary people cannot repair anything. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and uh, they came, mm -hmm. they knocked on the door, and I said, and my manservant uh, was out of breath. He ran up the stairs to come to my study, and I was seated on a, a sofa and reading. He said, they have come. I said, be calm. Open the door, let them in, don't say anything, go back to your room, and don't come out. No matter what happens, I was afraid they will beat me, and they will, uh, ser my servants will come out and get beaten up too. So I put the book on the bookshelf, and I saw a copy of the Chinese Constitution. The communists wrote a very uh, nice constitution. One of the statement was that uh, people, uh, nobody can enter a private home without a warrant. So I took the constitution and slowly went downstairs. And I met the Red Guards and their teachers right in the hall downstairs. And uh, a young man, red guard, maybe 17, stood like this and said to me, very close to my face, he said, we are the red guards. We have come to take revolutionary action against you. Hand over the keys. I had the keys already in my pocket. So I held up the Chinese constitution I said, according to the Constitution, you cannot enter a private home without a search warrant. He tore the Constitution out of my hand, threw it on the floor, and said, the Constitution is abolished. Then I laid the key on the, I had a mean, uh, it's, all my furnitures were Manu made specially for me because when I we settled down in ha Shanghai, I ordered this from a shop. They were all copies of Ming Dynasty furniture. Was a chest. Over the chest was a mirror with the uh, mahogany wood carved on the side, and uh, on this little chest was a Kangxi blue and white vase. I put the key there, and he said the key, and they dispersed, and they pushed me into the dining room. So I sat in the dining room by the table, and I looked at this to say goodbye to all my things. Because I, I, you see, these are jade figures, mm -hmm. jade jars, mm -hmm. and ivory. Japanese dancers, ivory, ivory, and all the little things. They were musical instruments and little bowls and uh, snuff bottles. Can, and can so. you hold it in front of you? I'll get a closer shot of that. Ah? Can you hold it, hold it up? I see. Yeah. This? Yeah. I never show it to anybody. So those are all the figurines uh, and, and very valuable. And they destroyed them all. 
Yes. This came from my friend in England. Now my friend is dying of cancer. I talked to her on the telephone. And they destroyed everything. Uh, yeah, they, uh, these things, uh, I, I don't know where they have gone to. I think they pocketed them, Themselves. you know. And uh, uh, they put, uh, I was in the dining room, and uh, the dining room had a window rather like this. The living room had a French window. Mm -hmm. You can walk out to the garden from the living room. Mm -hmm. And my uh, manservant, came to the outside, to the knock on the uh, window. He knew uh, I was in that room. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, I think I should go to the film studio and tell Mei Ping not to come home. Mm -hmm. I said, good idea. So he, mm -hmm. because uh, Mei Ping would uh, come home in the middle of it all. She might get beat. Yes, too. and I didn't want her to get insulted too. So they were there all night. And I went to Mei Ping's room, had to sleep, because they didn't disturb her room. Hmm. Uh, they had their own principles, that Mei Ping was an independent wage earner. <laughs> she, uh, although her family was bad, she herself was okay at that juncture. Hmm. And uh, so they, uh, her room was not disturbed. So there. I lay down on her bed and had a good sleep. You know, I, I'm, I'm like that. What is all these things? Uh, I have it, I enjoy it. I don't have it, so what? I don't care. You know, it's uh, what the Chinese call shen wai zhu. It's outside my body, I don't care. Of course, they not, uh, knock me down and kick me. That's, uh, I had to put up with. And uh, I argue with them, you know, when they have interrogation. Tell us about that. So, I, uh, the next morning, the Red Guards more or less finished their destroy, destruction. And their school brought those hot buns. So they were seated on the staircase and so on, eating the buns. And then they to told me to go to the third floor and to select one set of winter clothes, one set of summer clothes to set aside for Mei Ping and me. Mm -hmm. Only one set of clothes. The rest, they, all, they took all. And they also took all my jewelry. Uh, and actually, I had a, a very valuable jade necklace, which came down from my mother's family. And uh, they tore it open and the jade beads scattered in the garden, in the mud and so on. They, they had no idea. And these were very young teenagers. Yes, those kids, you know, they never seen anything. Uh, the, uh, when they first came in, into my uh, house, they didn't dare to walk on the carpet because I'm sure they never, they seen, never seen any carpet. Mm -hmm. You see, so they were poor, so they were know, working class kids. 15 years old, 16? Um, I think, uh, yes, they were uh, senior high, probably. But they were prompted by their teachers to do it, this, right? No, the teachers weren't just watching them so they don't kill anybody. Oh. Okay. You know, because uh, then it become difficult. Mao Zedong always said, we don't want to kill people because uh, if you cut off the top, of, um, I think, garlic or something. It can grow again. If you cut off somebody's head, it doesn't grow again, in case we want to ask him some questions. But they did kill a lot of people, though, eventually. But right? actually, they <laughs> torture, and then people die. Mm -hmm. but they actually shoot not too many people. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they love to arrest. Even if you were a senior communist official, you can't escape. Mm -hmm. Mao would put them in this special prison. And you know Liu Shaoqi, mm -hmm. the chairman of the People's Republic of China. His wife was locked up longer than I. 
uh, and she had chains on her feet all the time. Mm -hmm. how, you, were you bound all the time? No, no, no. Only when they are interrogating. During those 11, 12 days. And you still have the marks, right? Oh, yes, I have the scars. Scars. Uh, and also, uh, this circulation is affected. Uh, I always have icy cold hand in the winter. So this is yes. not, this is arthritis now. You see, look at my arthritis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very painful. Mm -hmm. When I uh, before I go, only one finger not affected. See, I cut myself because I'm not good at uh, uh, doing housework. See, I cut myself. Okay. <laughs> I'm always in a hurry. <laughs> you also mentioned that the. the um, Prison guards, they, they would kick prisoners. Uh, and they, about the you shoes? see, they, uh, uh, yeah, well, I made them angry. They slapped my face and they slapped this way, mm -hmm. you know, this way and then with the back of their head. Right. Slap. Because I argue with them, you see. Most prisoners are <laughs> scared to death, but, but I was never scared of them. I, I uh, during my husband's lifetime, he was going to the office, and I had cook, two man servant, one uh, uh, maid servant, and two gardeners. I had nothing to do, so I bought all these books written by Karl Marx, and so I studied it, <laughs> and I loved uh, studying. You know, I read all of it. I could quote Mao's book, and uh, uh, they, th those people who were trying to abuse me, they never read them. So you quote them back to them? Uh, they, they only uh, know a few slogans, you know, re that they m were forced to memorize, mm -hmm. usually from the Mao's little red book. But you I read them, I read Karl Marx's books in both English and Chinese. I had them all, I had them all. Mm -hmm. Because I, w I said to myself, I'm now living in a communist country. I want to know what it's all about. But actually, it's not the same. No, it's, it's, Mao, a big, it's, a, it's a big lie. It was uh, actually Mao Zedong dictatorship. He used uh, whatever that suits him. But I learned two things from studying Marxism, which I found most useful for the rest of my life, even now. Two things. One is never look upon life as static. Everything is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. If you believe in this, you would never worry. Because when you have a problem, you haven't found a solution. You know that you haven't given it enough time. Eventually, as time goes on, you will learn more and more about that problem. You will find a solution. So you don't need to worry too much. You use your brain, analyze. This is called the theory of constant change. Constantly the world, you know, the hour you entered my apartment, that's gone. That will never come back again. We already have gone on because it's constantly changing. Another thing I learned from Marx's theory is the economy of any society is the foundation. The social system, the political system are upper structures built on the economic foundation. This is so true. If you don't have a good economy, other things cannot work. This is so true mm -hmm. for the person too. Economic. It's your economic position in society that determines your position in society. It's so true. Mm -hmm. These two things, if you can use it as basic principles to guide your life, you, you mostly you can succeed. It, it's people who see everything as static. 
that they got dropped behind. Mm -hmm. Especially now with the internet. Never mind uh, uh, any period. Mm -hmm. Now it moves along more quickly. Mm -hmm. You have to be with it. I, I want to go back to um, that night. Not that night, but the six and a half years. You know, you said that yes. there were some very, very brutal people, pr uh, yeah. prison guards. Well, but there was only one nice person. You know, and also the girl from the kitchen, because when they tied my hand, uh, arms behind me, I couldn't eat very well. I had to, uh, you know, there is a little, uh, little opening on the door mm -hmm. with a cover that they can operate from outside. I cannot open it or close. Th they open that and hand you uh, a container, oval container, with rice and the cabbage on top, they hand it to you. And you take it and sit down on the bed and eat. Then you hand it back to them, you know, when they collect the container. This girl uh, worked in the kitchen, delivered the food on a cart. Each cell that she delivers. I, after my hands were tied behind me, and in the end I fainted, and fell on the ground. That night, she hid two hard-boiled eggs mm. under my rice. Mm. And she did not want to collect the empty container because she was afraid that I might say thank you mm. and expose her. Mm. So when she came to outside my door, she yelled in a loud voice. She said, you're always so slow. When you finish, gave the container to the guard on duty. She did not open the uh, little window in case I said thank you. She buried two hard-boiled eggs for me to eat. Now that's out of the kindness of her heart, and there was no way I could pay her back. And if it, she was discovered, she would have been... Oh, yes, the, severely punished, mm -hmm. because we were enemies, the prisoners, considered to be enemies of the government. Whether you are guilty or not is another question. To the guards and the people who work there, we are guilty. Because you were Otherwise, you wouldn't be, be incarcerated. Right. Um, w what were they trying to do? They, they were trying to torture you? Well, to they, they tried to make me say that I was a spy. And a shell uh, office in Shanghai was a spy organization. Because during the interrogation, I analyzed, and this was aimed at Zhou Enlai. Because if they, Zhou Enlai personally uh, signed a document to allow Shell to operate in China. Mm. You see, I sh tell you this case. In early 1950, there was a Chinese oil national, that's government oil company, lighter, a small ship in Hong Kong Harbor. The officers on this little ship wanted to go to Taiwan, take the ship to Taiwan. The crew wanted to return to the mainland. So they had a fight. As a result of their fight, the Hong Kong government didn't know what to do with this ship, so they took it over. Because the Hong Kong government took over a ship that the communists claimed to belong to them, so they ordered Shell's property to be requisitioned. Requisition does not take over. That means the use for the time being. Actually, they saved Shell because we weren't allowed to import oil. Oh, we had a lot of oil, which we sold to the government. So we got a big lot of money in the China, uh, communist bank, you know. And they requisitioned our property. So our refinery, all these service stations all over China, they took over. If we had to pay the land tax and the 
not allowed to sack any of the staff. We couldn't last more than a year, even with the money they paid us for the oil. They requisitioned. So all these people, the government took over. We didn't have to pay them anything. So we were able, and then we were allowed to rent out the different floors of that, the huge building. We only had one floor for our office because we no longer had business like old days. Many people left, the foreigners all left. We just had an office for our doctor and one floor for our staff. We were reduced to something like 56 people from something like 10,000 with all the service stations all over China, from Sichuan and, uh, and Manchuria, all, uh, all over. They took over. Requisition to punish Shell. What but year was this? This was 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, they took over 49, you know. Mm -hmm. And my husband just entered Shell because he promised to help them one year. And then when the year ended, the universities were taken over too. And he wasn't uh, a, a, a professor. He was a temporary, part-time professor. So he no longer belonged to those universities. Thank God, because it's no life if you have to have a supervision, supervisor who didn't understand anything you were teaching to tell you how to teach. <laughs> and uh, so he went to work for Shell with the government encouragement, you could even say. And uh, we were allowed to rent out the other floors to the government office. They paid us rent. So even if we did no business, we could go on for a long time. How long did Shell last? In last until the year of the Cultural Revolution. 66. Yes, with our business and uh, the money we had in the bank. And we were paid interest on the money. But you never saw But it that. was Zhou Enlai who signed the document to allow Shell to keep her head office and uh, also the garages uh, in, uh, in another part of Shanghai uh, and the driver's uh, dormitory over the garages. So we had four cars and eight driver or eight or nine drivers because some of them worked at night or weekends and so on. And this whole building we'd rent out. So, so you think that... And those Chinese communist office they love to be in shell building because we had central heating. <laughs> and you think that part of the reason why they wanted you to confess was so was that... Was to use my confession to Get attack back. Joe Enlai. The most, uh, the least they can accuse him of was make a mistake. Mm -hmm. They can even go further and say he facilitated spying. Because, by because, foreign because you company. Would be a convicted spy. I I I sensed that this was that made me even more firm to resist them because there was always a man to copy everything down what I said ri written down what I what I was asked what I said and there was a record you know and they didn't make me say uh, what they wanted, but Nixon came, so we were all released. And when I was, was released... Was it after or before Nixon came, when you were released? Oh, after. Afterwards. They, they released the... You know, I did not know, because I was in the woman's prison. It was a small building. Mm -hmm. all, every British bank and uh, uh, the head... The, number one Chinese of uh, all the foreign companies in Shanghai were locked up in the man's building. They all knew each other were there because they could hear them. And the few I, I saw after I came out, none of them confessed because they all saw through this was uh, not because of us they put us in prison. 
they wanted to use us to accuse the more mild faction of the Communist Party leaders. Mao wanted to get rid of them. You see, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, and a whole bunch of them. Liu Shaoqi died because they realized Mao's policy wasn't working. And the people were starving. And they can't go on like that. And so they were Communist Party leaders. They still believed in communism. But they wanted to go by this way, what they are doing now. So Mao did not win. After he died, they win. But in the meantime, they killed a number of them. And uh, the other people, like myself, not related. Uh, I mean, those leaders don't even know that I exist, had to be sacrificed. Because they arrested all the most senior Chinese in every foreign company, including Norwegian, Swedish. And they forced us to confess, because it was Zhou Enlai's policy to have the Western companies in China. He didn't want to cut them off altogether. Now tell me, tell me um, you know, six and a half years, that's a long time. Yes, a long time, but I must have been very healthy. So I was the first child of my mother. My mother was 21 when I was born. You know, now it's fashionable for women to have children after they're 40, 35. That's uh, leaving it too late. What, what, what kept you going? You, you mentioned a little bit Well, I religion. believe in God. Mm -hmm. I prayed. Mm -hmm. I prayed real hard. I believed God is just. God often does something we don't understand. We must trust that in the end, everything will be all right. So I was optimist. I thought I would walk out that prison. You did? Yeah. Well, uh, very nearly didn't because my health broke down. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I even, it, you know, my arthritis, my heart, I came out with uh, heart palpitation and uh, rapid heartbeat and irregular heartbeat. Now it's much worse, really? much worse. And I won't take medicine now because I'm 88. Two years now I haven't taken any medicine because those medicine makes me forgetful. They dull my mind. I'd rather live uh, and control my own life shorter than to live with my mind damaged I depend on other people longer. What is the point of living longer? I lived a long life already. I'm satisfied, more than satisfied. I didn't expect to live more than 80. And now I'm 88. Two more years, you're 90. Even if I'm, uh, I have cancer now, I, I won't die right away. I will be very nearly 90. You don't have cancer, do you? I don't know. You never know. Well, you look but, very... But uh, <clears throat> there is a punishment for people who live long because you lose your family members, people you love, and your friends. The last few years, every year, I lost four or five friends. And I, uh, my book helped me make lots of friends. I have lots of friends, and I've lived here 20 years now. I, my, I have many good neighbors. We help each other. Uh, on Monday, I have to go to see a doctor. A, friend, a neighbor will help, will drive me. And when my neighbors get sick, I drive them. You still drive? Oh, I still drive. Oh, oh I, I'm going to uh, have a, uh, my license renewed in July. Good. Uh, so I, I, I'm doubly careful uh, because if I even have a scraped fender, they will not give it to me. Oh, is that right? They will use that as, as an excuse. excuse. To deny it, yeah. I, I don't have hmm. anything. Clean record. Uh, today I drove, uh, I went to get water, I went to grocery store, I went to drugstore. 
I went, I was out. I came back at 2.30 mm -hmm. and had a little something to eat for lunch. Let, let me ask you um, Any one more question. questions? I think we covered everything. Almost. Um, and it, it, about, about your daughter, you know. Yes. What, what, what happened? Uh, 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 you see, they told me that she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Because during that time, many people did commit suicide by jumping out of the window. Right. But after Mao died, six, 75, 76, he died. Mm -hmm. After Mao died, people start to talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of her high school friends, became a doctor, and she was on duty at the hospital for emergency that night. Uh, no, not at, at daybreak. Mei Ping's corpse was sent to that hospital early in the morning by pass, people passing by on Nanking Road. And she said Mei Ping had wounds. If she jumped out of a window, her body should not have wounds. She was beaten. And the man now is out of prison. Twenty years he served, the leader of the gang. That beat her? Yes. He was a, a worker mm -hmm. of a textile factory. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do something to please the, communist. the uh, commun government. Uh, I mean Mao's set faction, mm -hmm. and not him alone, there was a group, and six people they beat to death. Mei Ping was one. They were all from so-called the wrong kind of family background. And they had an open trial after I left China. Mm -hmm. They gave me my visa very quickly. They wanted to get me out of there, because during the open trial, the members of the family could express an opinion. They were all asked if the sentence satisfied them. They knew I, I would not be satisfied because they gave the man death penalty, but uh, what do you call it? Not. Uh, Executed life, right life, away. Life in prison? No. Uh, they, they sentenced him to death penalty, the leader, but delayed, uh, what is it, to observe his behavior. Probation? Pro uh, then they gave him 20 years. They reduced the sentence. W was your daughter in a, in a prison when this happened? Or where no, was she, she was never put in prison. This happened in an office. So, uh, it's athletic association office from the ninth floor. They threw her body down to fake suicide. And th this man... Um, he was the leader, but he, he was not necessarily the person who caused her to da die. Was, that's their excuse. And he behaved well under incarceration. So they released him after 20 years. Was he, was he a... Uh, he was just an ordinary worker. But he belonged to the Jiangqing. He supported Mao's wife. The Gang of Four? Yes. And he belonged to their group. What, what year was this? Um, my daughter died 19, the one year after I was in prison. I was imprisoned in September 1966. She died in June 1967. So was it still the Red Guards? or what, what? No, not the Red Guards. Red Guards, uh, yeah. to, they just use them to right. destroy your home. That's so what, what did this man belong to? I mean, he was a worker, ordinary worker. And they form every factory, every office, the activists formed a nucleus to support the Cultural Revolution. They're, they call themselves the proletarian revolutionaries, Wu Chan Jie Ji Geming Pai. Yet they, the ordinary workers, they don't, they don't need to join. They carry on with their work. Why do you think they? they because they hope to become official. You see, mm -hmm. Mao, after every political movement, he promote some activists to be officials.
So in order to get ahead with their career, these people were ambitious. Why do you think they, were they interrogating your daughter? What were they doing? No, that I would never know. Nobody will ever know because they certainly wouldn't talk. Mm -hmm. They wanted her to say I was a spy. She knew because I, I refused to say I was a spy. This started before they got hold of her. When she was still at the film studio, they put her under house arrest mm -hmm. in the film studio. How old was she when she died? She was uh, 25. She was born 1942, 25. Beautiful woman, too, your daughter. I think we should stop now. Okay. Yes, that's enough. <laughs>